Established in 2007, Middle East Studies at Marine Corps University brings in guest lecturers to speak about topics of importance to the United States Marine Corps and wider Department of Defense and U.S. government communities concerning the Middle East broadly defined. In line with Middle East Studies mission, the MES lecture series and other MES talks and panels provide up-to-date information and analysis on the broader Middle East, including South and Central Asia, North and Sub-Saharan Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the Black Sea and Red Sea regions. I'm Dr. Christopher Anzalone. I'm Assistant Professor of Middle East Studies at the Krulak Center. And it's our great Middle East Studies great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jason Warner from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, uh, Head of Africa Research at the Combating Terrorism and a Professor in the Department of Social Sciences at, at, at West Point. Um, he is an uh, expert on African politics and sort of African current affairs, and particularly on jihadist movements, jihadi movements in Africa. His most recent book is on that, um, which is the uh, which is the Islamic State in Africa, the emergence, evolution, and future of the next jihadist battlefront, which um, I think is coming out in the U.S. in April, I believe, from Oxford. It's, or, it's is out. It out? Oh, it's out. out. Great. Okay, so ago. it's from Oxford University Press and. Uh, I hand it over to you, Dr. Warner. Thank you for joining sure. us. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. And uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am, you know, speaking from West Point, so so understand, uh, you know, uh, the, the the sorts of audiences that you are. I'll also just note that, uh, as I mentioned to Chris, I'm <clears throat> severely under the weather today. So uh, my my goal in this talk is not only to educate educate, but also not to um, have any <laughs> real health issues in the midst of this. So. Um, please bear with me. Um, so, as Chris mentioned, uh, and Chris is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, he is someone who could have just as easily written this book and someone who I look up to tremendously as a scholar. So I really appreciate the invitation. Um, so, as Chris mentioned, uh, I just came out with this book on the Islamic State in Africa. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is give a talk about the book itself, but also um, <clears throat> go into a little bit about its contemporary relevance for, for current affairs. And so, um, particularly with this uh, intimate group uh, and with Chris's expertise in the virtual room, uh, I would just, you know, open the floor to any questions and any interventions as they come, rather than sort of waiting for questions until the end. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, to start off, uh, I'll just note that these are not my employers opinions. You all know all too well uh, some of the caveats we have to give, but having given this presentation to a number of different audiences, I just have to start this by saying these are my own personal opinions uh, and not those of <coughs> um, any of these entities. <coughs> so this is a uh, the cover of the book. This is actually an outdated cover, uh, but um, in any case, the, the book really uh, emerged in about 2017 when um, I had been at the Combating Terrorism Center for uh, about a year, um, and I was hired to help the Combating Terrorism Center, which is a think tank within uh, the Department of Social Sciences at West Point, um, to, to better understand and have some degree of expertise on uh, Islamist movements in Africa. Um, when I came in late 2016, excuse me, uh, <laughs> the Islamic State's presence uh, was was somewhat new on the continent and was growing. <clears throat> so this book really served as um, the the first effort to put together what is really a, a, a broad kind of overarching history of how the Islamic State uh, found a foothold in, in on the continent of Africa, um, <clears throat> how it emerged uh, and how it spread. How different Islamic State provinces compare and contrast with one another, uh, and some of the factors that will impact the future of the Islamic State in Africa. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm really having trouble speaking here. <coughs> As Chris mentioned, it was released in the UK in December 2021, and it's now available <clears throat> in the US. So these are some of the guiding questions <coughs> of the book, um, and. These are some of the, the, the phenomena that motivated its creation. So uh, in the first part, I'm really going to speak about uh, the book itself. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about uh, some of my perceptions of its contemporary relevance. 
So some of the main arguments of the book, um, and, and this is not sort of a central argument, but it's this is sort of a broader takeaway, is that as of 2022, uh, the African continent is, is what I argue and what others have argued uh, to be the new epicenter of jihadist violence. And the Islamic State's rise on the continent is in large part responsible for this. When it comes to understanding the rationales for why African insurgent groups pledged allegiance to the Islamic State Central between 2014 and 2019, which is the time period of interest for this book, um, it's because we argue that they anticipated either benefits for individual leaders of these insurgent movements, or they anticipated benefits for um, their entire insurgent groups. Another main argument of the book um, is that among the eight formal Islamic State provinces in Africa and one additional um, Tunisian non-province affiliate, um, that all of these groups had what we call similar life cycle moments. Um, and, and that's to say that <clears throat> the book's organization is one that looks at how insurgent groups um, experienced their being uh, pre-Baya, in other words, before pledging allegiance, um, in this um, sort of intermediary period after they had pledged buy up, but before that buy up had been accepted, um, and then in the post buy up period after they had become um, official Islamic State provinces. And so essentially, what we argue is that a sort of useful heuristic is to look at all of these groups as having somewhat similar um, life cycle bookends to some extent. Um, nevertheless, despite these sort of um, in, in some cases, uh, or in most cases, um, comparable life cycle moments, uh, in practice, uh, the Islamic State provinces on the continent uh, had radically different experiences when it came to conducting violence, uh, attempting governance, and actual territorial control. One of the big arguments of the book and one of the, the main lines of research that we had um, was really to try to understand not just how Islamic State provinces looked in and of themselves, but really what the nature of their connections with the Islamic State Central uh, have been. And one of our main arguments is that um, the Islamic State Central has historically tended to exert indirect rather than direct control um, or influence on its African provinces. Um, this is a very contentious topic in the study of uh, African jihadist movements and, and sort of transnational jihadist movements more generally. And so we wanted to be sure in the course of writing this book that this sort of topic came to the fore. Um, contemporarily, uh, and our book doesn't focus on this because the time period again was from 2014 to 2019, but in sort of placing this in broader uh, contemporary context, uh, one of my main arguments when I, when I speak on this topic is that the situation um, of the Islamic State's violence and, and that of Al Qaeda as well on the African continent is, is quite serious uh, and it shows few signs of significant improvement uh, and, and really um, collective action, I argue, uh, is needed. So just very quickly, uh, we're not gonna belabor this, but so that you can understand the nature of the book, um, the book is really organized by um, provinces. And so the chapters are situated in, in this order that corresponds to how these provinces emerged on the continent. Um, and with each province, we divide the chapter on that province into these three periods, the pre buy up period, the buy up period, and the post buy up period. And, uh, and this is sort of the general outline of, of how these are structured. So for each uh, of these provinces, we look at a particular temporal moment in their life cycles through the lens of new terms that we've created that we help that we think um, help explain and um, give insight into what was going on sort of in broad terms across all of these provinces at various moments. Here you see these terms of the democratization of jihad, affiliate, utility, validation, and sovereign subordinates. I'll spend just a moment in the next slide uh, sort of discussing what these mean. But in essence, this is the nature of the layout of the book. We organize it by provinces and by time periods um, that each of these provinces experienced. So uh, just briefly to, to help you understand kind of how the book evolves, um, 
we have these three uh, terms that we think are useful, not only to think about the Islamic states, emergence and evolution <clears throat> on the African continent, but, but sort of more generally in, in terrorism and, and transnational jihadi studies. So in the first period, uh, this pre biop period, um, we were really interested in this pre biop period about sort of what made African insurgent groups begin to look at the Islamic State Central and think that um, for some reason pledging allegiance to it would be beneficial. And so in this pre biop period, before these groups actually pledged allegiance, we introduced this term of the democratization of jihad. And by that, we're trying to capture this notion that um, the Islamic State's rise in the transnational uh, global jihadi sphere really served to democratize the international jihadist landscape, essentially creating a bipolar uh, jihadist world order where previously only Al Qaeda had, had dominated a unipolar order. And so essentially, uh, we argue that the Islamic State's global rise opened up all sorts of new possibilities for power accrual, either for individuals or groups simply by creating this new bipolar and democratized um, jihadi transnational order. In the second period, uh, which is after groups have pledged allegiance, but before they've been formally accepted, uh, we, we introduced this term called affiliate utility validation. And by this, we're essentially describing the phenomenon whereby African insurgent groups, after pledging allegiance to the Islamic State Central, needed to prove utility Right? They needed to prove usefulness, and they needed to have that usefulness validated uh, by the Islamic State Central to show, in essence, that they merited elevation to formal provinces. And so here, we're, we, we spend time in this sort of life cycle moment of these provinces trying to articulate <clears throat> what provinces had to do, um, what sort of usefulness they had to show to the Islamic State Central to get it to elevate them to provincial status. As, as we note here, that could be through uh, evidence of violence, governance, uh, <coughs> uh, media production, or the like. In the final period, uh, which is after these insurgent groups had been elevated to formal provinces of the Islamic State, um, we, we introduced this term of sovereign subordinates. And by this, um, we are trying to describe the relationship between African provinces of the Islamic State and the Islamic State Central itself. And here, this term sovereign subordinates is really intended to um, serve as a juxtaposition, where on one hand, um, by pledging allegiance to the Islamic State Central, these insurgent groups were officially subordinate, right? There was, they existed in a, in a subordinate position in the sort of international hierarchy to the Islamic State Central. But in reality, uh, when it comes to day-to-day -day operations, they were essentially sovereign. In other words, they were, were sort of rarely beholden in any strict um, ways to the Islamic State Central. So these are the three terms that sort of appear throughout the book. They appear um, in each chapter, <coughs> and we think they give a, a, a sort of coherence to the entire book and to the, to the experiences of each of these provinces. So that's sort of the book, right? That's that's sort of the nature of the book, and you know, without going too deeply into it, that's sort of what you can expect if you if you look at the book. What I think is more important and more useful is how all of that ties into real world events. So we're going to discuss uh, the contemporary relevance of all of that um, and and some of the insights from the book to contemporary um, phenomena. So uh, one of the questions that we often get asked when we're speaking to uh, members of the U.S. government, military, international organizations is, is, you know, when did these African insurgent groups begin to pledge allegiance to the Islamic State um, and why? So this is just a very brief primer um, <clears throat> on sort of mentally um, and sort of geographically how to think about this evolution. So uh, if you're not familiar with the African Center for Strategic Studies, uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's at the National Defense University. Uh, check it out. This is a map borrowed from them. Uh, so, so this is the landscape uh, pre, uh, in, in blue, uh, pre-2014, pre-emergence of the Islamic State. And here, the two sort of uh, nodes of transnational jihadist activity on the continent were really uh, in the form of AQIM, 
and Al Shabab, oh, excuse me, and Al Shabab. Um, and so these were two Al Qaeda branches, and these were really sort of the main nodes of um, the transnational jihadist movement in Africa. But in 2014, as I noted, um, insurgent groups starting pledging allegiance to the Islamic State and becoming uh, Islamic State provinces or Walaya. So what does this look like? In 2014, we see pledges and acceptance from insurgent groups in Algeria, Libya, and Sinai. Uh, by 2015, the Islamic State West Africa province emerged after the group known as Boko Haram pledged allegiance and was accepted by the Islamic State. Um, in 20, between 2015 and 2016, uh, pledges came from the Islamic State, um, a, a group that would later become known as the Islamic State in Greater Sahara and the Sahel and the Islamic State in Somalia, which was a, a breakaway faction from um, al-Shabaab. And then um, in uh, roughly 2018, uh, the Islamic State Central Africa province um, what would become a Central Africa province had two groups pledge allegiance, um, <clears throat> one in DRC and another in Northern Mozambique, excuse me. Uh, it's important to note, as you see these uh, dotted lines emerge, that we have, um, in the case of the West Africa province, two branches. Um, they both, the, both of these groups constitute the West Africa province. And in the Central African province, in DRC and Mozambique, these are the two groups that constitute different wings of the same province of the Central African province. I'll also note, um, before we move forward, that as of, uh, it was last week, I believe, that um, this uh, relationship between ISWAP Greater Sahara and the West Africa province, the, the, the one based in Nigeria, which had previously sort of been the center of gravity of those two branches um, dissolved and the Islamic State declared a new wilayat in, um, in the Sahel. So this map is now outdated and the newest Islamic State province, um, as far as we're able to understand, is a new separate entity um, in, in the Sahel. So I, I present this just to sort of give a quick overview of, of sort of geographically how we should think about this. If, if you happen to be new to this question, new to these geographies, this is sort of what the landscape of the Islamic states, uh, provinces, and uh, Al Qaeda's branches looks like on the continent. Yes, Tony. Yes, not to avoid buying your book, I intend to do this so, but. Uh, could you describe what defines a wilayat itself? Is it self-contained malign network wherein they're self-funded uh, and, and only have to stay on message with higher headquarters? Or how does that work? Is it a self-sustaining organism? Over. Sure, thank you very much. And uh, in answering any of these questions, I told Chris uh, that he should jump in because he is just as knowledgeable as I am on, on all of these issues. So Chris, definitely uh, you know, uh, clean up after my answer here. You know, so essentially to become uh, an Islamic state wilayat or province, uh, an insurgent group needs to pledge allegiance to the Islamic State Central. Uh, the Islamic State Central needs to formally approve that pledge of Baya, declare that that group has become a province. And, and that's really sort of, you know, when it comes down to it, that that process occurs is all that's needed. Um, in terms of everything else, it, it can kind of, um, it, it just depends on the situation, right? So in theory, the Islamic State Central needs the provinces to fall in line with messaging. Uh, in terms of funding, it, it depends on the province and it depends on uh, on the temporal period. So in almost all cases, African provinces have really had to fund themselves. There's been relatively little um, evidence, though there is certainly some, particularly in the case of Libya, uh, increasingly in the case of ISCAP, of direct transfers of funding from the Islamic State Central, but they needed to fund themselves. Uh, in terms of their operations, uh, you know, the Islamic State has not been particularly <clears throat> um, regimented when it <laughs> comes to what is and is not acceptable. Um, th there have been shifts over time, but in essence, it's, uh, it's to become an Islamic State Wilayat or province, there's, it's really about this pledging and acceptance process more than any sort of demanded nomenclature that happens in the aftermath. Uh, 
Um, Chris, how would you add to that or or challenge that? And then we'll go to well, Suha. I would just ask um, if you could, from from your findings, what does Islamic State Central get out of these relationships? I mean, does it vary? And and so from the local perspective, there's as, as you mentioned, there's a debate particularly about ice cap in in Central Africa province. Um, what exactly is the relationship? First of all, what is the relationship between ice cap and uh, you know, ISIS central, if you will. And then mm -hmm. also, what is exactly the relationship? Because part of ISCAP is in right the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the other part is in northern Mozambique. So there's this debate about, you know, whether it's all local or whether it's this sort of local or hybrid uh, mix of those kinds of things. And uh, so what does Islamic State Central, the, the leadership in, in Syria and Iraq, what do they see as the benefit of you know, recognizing maybe like in Algeria, a very small, initially at least group. So what do they get out of it? And then what are some of the relationships between both within a, within different provinces like Islamic State, Central Africa province, and then also and the Sahara uh, or the Sahel and the ISWAP, and then also between the different factions, are there, are there you know, what evidence um, or what information uh, did you find about you know, Islamic State in Somalia and its relationship with Sinai or West Africa. So, sure. Chris, if it's okay, um, that's uh, all of those are answered in a few slides later. Sure. So, yeah. not avoiding the question, but we'll, we'll talk Definitely. about all that in depth. Yep, certainly. Um, uh, Suha, if, if you'd like to ask a question that's, that's relevant to this portion, please. Uh, actually, it is relevant to democratization of jihad. Sure, certainly. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm originally from Iraq and I am a PhD student who work on ISIS. So oh. I yeah, thank you so much. So I am so I am like interested why you chose like the word the word of uh, democratization, especially it is like Al Bayah, because I am a I'm Arabic speaker, so I read Arabic. So so Al Bayah it's already include the word like the uh, like the context democra democracy so why you why you didn't choose like decentralization instead of democratization mm -hmm. so it's just like uh, so it's already like it's involved in al -Bayah. so that's why i'm interested in, in this part yeah. it's a fantastic question and i have to say that we have uh, had we had extensive debates on if the word democratization was correct. Uh, one of the authors, uh, so I'm the lead author, but then there were three other uh, folks who worked with me, and our our Arabic speaker, uh, Hani and Saibia, said when we first introduced this term, he was like, "Why are we calling this democratization?" And and his point, at least in terms of the word democratization, was um, that this suggested to him at least that somehow. <clears throat> When we said democratization of jihad, or that the the rise of the Islamic State democratized jihad, in his mind, and I think sort of linguistically, he was under the impression that that was a wrong way to talk about it because it suggested that the Islamic State's rise made um, particular jihadi voices um, come to the fore more. In other words, it, it made things more equitable, more more sort of rights based. Um, and what what the what the term democratization of jihad means is not anything related to sort of people gaining more rights because that certainly didn't happen at all. It, you know, to your point, it could have equally been said decentralization of jihad or um, the creation of a bipolar jihadi world. It basically, we were trying to get to the point of um, insurgent groups had greater choices. In, in terms of who they could pledge allegiance to. So in terms of their choices, their choices were democratized. It's the democratization of choice rather than the democratization of experiences, if that makes sense. I, I, I don't know. If I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, like, as a native Arabic speaker, if sure. it is I'm allowed to say that. But for me, like, when I, like, I heard the word democratization, like, you get, like, it's give me impression there's a lot of sympathy and there's like a lot of mm. romanticization to this war. So it's like if there's one like this will like more attract people to to join jihad because they, they join, they give you the right to join where actually they are not. So that's interesting. Yeah. So 
especially because you are like your audience is just not just like the American citizen or sure. like the English uh, English audience or speaker. So this is maybe you, I'm I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that, but this is, but I feel like it will attract people to think they are they are very good groups to join them. Especially you have people people read bilingual. So that's interesting. No, it's it's a fantastic point. I've never heard that. Um, uh, Makes yeah, it so, so in, nice. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's it's a really interesting point. I'd never thought about that. We spent a lot of time thinking about the word democratization. We ended up just saying, we think it's the best fit, at least in English, because again, we are writing in English. But to your point, of course, the audience is not exclusively English speaking. Um, yeah. But no, it's it's a really interesting point, and I'll think more about that. Certainly, our our yeah, goal is to... like for me, like I just like wow. So there's the psychological perspective here that is like I feel like wow, it's so nice. They have democracy. They will like, and especially the democracy joining with the free of human rights, and so that and there is a freedom of joining, and there is many rights. So that's mm -hmm. that's my point here. Yeah, and and your point is essentially that it's the exact opposite of that. That like it's it's the most anti democratic organization you might. That's why I felt enjoy. like especially yeah. like they are include democracy, so it's like maybe decentralization yeah. is <laughs> is just my point. I take your point. No, no, no. Certainly, it's very interesting, and I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Perhaps autocracy autocracy Thanks, might be the the governing term. Yeah. Thank you right. so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Right. So we'll move along, but please feel free to uh, interject. I mean, these are these are super interesting points. Um, we'll, we'll skip here, uh, but I but I think the next point that I wanted to bring to the fore is, you know, why pledge allegiance to the Islamic State at all? And we argue um, that between 2014 and 2019, which is the time period of investigation uh, of the book, it, there were all sorts of rationales as to why individuals or African insurgent groups decided to pledge allegiance. Um, and so here are just a, 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 a slight sampling of them. In some cases, there was what we found to be genuine ideological proximity. In other words, there was genuine theological, ideological buy-in uh, by African insurgent groups for the Islamic State uh, in Iraq and Syria's project. I think we see this most acutely in the emergence of the Islamic State in Libya, where several of the uh, initial members um, had actually been uh, sort of in, in Iraq and particularly Syria with the the various people who uh, you know stood up um, the Islamic State Central. In other cases, groups pledged allegiance to the Islamic State Central when their own groups had suffered losses. So, in the case of the Islamic State in Sinai, uh, the group known as Ansar Beit al Maktis, having lost a large cadre of its leadership um, through Egyptian counterterrorism operations. Um, decided, some of its lower level members decided they needed assistance uh, from a sort of parent group. And so that was one of their main rationales for pledging allegiance. Um, in other cases, African insurgent groups pledged allegiance to the Islamic State Central because the Islamic State Central reached out to them and uh, sort of effectuated term campaigns of some, some degree. Um, in other cases, it was really a leader centric decision, uh, though this point is somewhat uh, up for debate. Um, Boko Haram's leader at the time, Abu Bakr Shakao, sort of wanted, uh, according to some accounts, to be perceived as being a sort of global player. And so to join the Islamic State's network uh, was really sort of a way to, to go global. Uh, in other cases, and I think this is one of the more sort of interesting rationales for pledging allegiance to the Islamic State uh, Central, it's that lower level or mid-level or aspiring jihadis within Al-Qaeda-dominated groups right, in either AQIM or in Al-Shabaab, um, who sought to sort of have higher positions, um, realized that if they broke away from their Al-Qaeda orbits and pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, they could sort of leapfrog in terms of their own personal um, grandeur. And so to break away from Al-Qaeda groups became uh, a new sort of way to accrue personal power for some leaders. We see this in the case of uh, the Islamic State uh, in Somalia and um, <coughs> the Islamic State in Greater Sahara. Uh, there are all sorts of other rationales, but this is just a sampling as we, we sort of move along. Uh, another question that we sought to answer was, how do these Islamic State provinces compare and contrast to one another? So uh, one of the main metrics that we can look at, yes, Ms. Hassan. 
I think that's from before. It's from before? Sure. Yeah. Uh, one of the ways that we uh, can, can sort of compare and contrast uh, these provinces is uh, in terms of their violence. And so, again, one of the fundamental sort of arguments of our book is that um, we, we can't sort of talk about a unified experience of the Islamic state, uh, of an Islamic state province in Africa. In other words, all these provinces had sort of radically different experiences on the ground. But when we look at uh, a sort of contemporary metric, and again, this wasn't included in the book, this is more sort of contemporary, uh, these are the number of Islamic State claimed attacks by Wilayat in the first eight months of 2021. This is in, in global comparison. So here, uh, the arrows indicate African uh, provinces. And you'll see that, um, you know, second globally, uh, in terms of number of attacks was the Islamic State's West Africa province. Contemporarily, it's it's one of the sort of poster children of the Islamic State, uh, of the Islamic State Central. And we'll talk a bit more about this. Uh, then you see sort of these more middling provinces, the Islamic State Central Africa province, Sinai and Somalia. Um, <clears throat> At the lower end uh, is the Islamic State's Libya province with only three attacks during this period. <coughs> and then finally, you'll note here uh, that there were no attacks claimed by the Islamic State's Algeria province. And so here, this is just sort of a snapshot to show how radically different uh, African provinces can look in terms of their capability. There's no sort of one size fits all metric to think about um, what they can and cannot do. Uh, this is a very brief uh, sort of metric, just looking at the number of fighters that they have. This was from a project I did in 2018. This is now somewhat outdated, <clears throat> but it's possible to see the radically different fighter numbers that these groups had, uh, at least during this period. One of the big questions, and I'm trying to move along quickly so that we have time to, to sort of have a, a more uh, structured chat, um, is, is this question of what the relationship between these African provinces and the Islamic State Central actually is? And this sort of gets to Chris's uh, earlier question. So, uh, and, and this is really arguably, I think Chris might agree, the, the most contentious question in um, in a lot of these studies, right? For, for, for people who, who study uh, transnational jihadist movements, there's always this question of, you know, you're talking about the Islamic State in West Africa. Well, is is this group the, the previous group Boko Haram? Is this just a local group that has adopted this name and really has no connection? And by you, right, by, by people like me saying this is the Islamic State in West Africa, am I overblowing this? Right? Am I <coughs> sort of giving this group undue power, undue um, sort of prestige? My response to all of this is is essentially laid out here. All of these African provinces of the Islamic State have real tangible links with the Islamic State Central. So there was this sort of undercurrent going around about a year ago where people said, well, you know, the Islamic State has actually no even interaction with um, th these insurgent groups in, in DRC and Mozambique. It's just claiming attacks by local insurgent groups with really no interaction at all. That That's inaccurate. I mean, that, that's simply not true. So if the Islamic State has declared an African province a province, it, it, they have tangible links. Nevertheless, these links have historically been really weak. There is, they exist, but they're not profound. Um, I think importantly, um, the, one of the main part, points of the book is that these African provinces have really exerted tremendous amounts of autonomy. From everything that we've been able to ascertain across all of these provinces during this period, they've really sort of been left to their own devices. Um, they are in communication with the Islamic State Central. It sometimes gives them advice, but in no way does it have command and control of the provinces. And this is sort of what we're trying to emphasize. It's, it's a sort of very nuanced argument um, that we're trying to get to. One of the main um, consistencies, though, about these provinces' relationships with the Islamic State Central, though, is the dissemination of media. Uh, and for all of these provinces, uh, the Islamic State Central is the main point of dissemination for its media uh, products. Uh, importantly, this question of, of the Islamic State Central's dissemination of African provinces' media uh, is, has really been important for it since 2019 as it has sought to bolster its image. So one of the big sort of uh, developments, I think, right now in terms of the Islamic State in Africa is that 
despite it being a fundamentally uh, Iraq and Syria centric organization, uh, Africa is really uh, sort of, or African provinces have really taken up the mantle of the Islamic State um, at the moment. And so to get back to Chris's question about sort of what does the Islamic State Central get out of um, approving uh, these provinces, it, it's it's becoming clear that the Islamic State is leaning really heavily on its African provinces to bolster its image. So I think this is a phenomenal sort of example. Um, this is from a, a, a fantastic researcher on Twitter. Uh, you can see his handle here. Um, and <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, I'm feeling great today. Um, the this is the uh, number or the the origin countries of the Islamic State's attacks in 2021. And as you can note here, 14 of the top 20 most attacked states in the world by the Islamic State are African, right? The number two most attacked state in the world by the Islamic State is Nigeria. But once you get into uh, five uh, through 15, it, it, it you know, if Islamic State violence is essentially African. Um, and, and that's something that I think is only sort of coming to the fore. The, the most powerful uh, Islamic State presence is not necessarily in, concentrated in one African province, but rather it's disseminated across many of them. Another useful analytic, I think, to sort of underscore uh, the, the utility of Africa for the Islamic State Central um, is, is seen here. In this case, this is a, a tracking of Al Naba front pages uh, by country. So you'll see the country with the most front pages in uh, the Islamic State's Al Naba magazine were from Nigeria. Again, nine of the 12 states on the front cover of the Islamic State's main periodical uh, are African. So it's not just, yes, the Islamic State has a province or two here. It's, you know, in both of these cases, a, a more than half of, at least along these two metrics, which are sort of anecdotal, but it shows the influence of, of African presence in the Islamic State's uh, sort of uh, media campaign and, and sort of international presentation. I'll just note, and I, I do want to be sure that we are leaving lots of time to speak here, Beyond that sort of recognition that especially contemporarily African provinces are really sort of serving to bolster the Islamic State's international image, um, sort of tangible um, discrete instances of how the Islamic State Central and its African provinces have interacted are kind of murky, but here's a, uh, here are some examples. We've definitely seen the Islamic State Central sending personnel in the cases of Libya and Sinai. Um, <coughs> In the case of leadership uh, transitions in the West Africa province, the Islamic State Central didn't um, dictate uh, a leadership change, but it de did definitely approve uh, a shift in leadership. There have been evidence of TTPs going from Islamic State Central to its provinces. Uh, money transfers are contemporarily uh, be coming to light as, as more and more frequent from IS Central to its provinces. <clears throat> Some of you may recall earlier in March, uh, the uh, Treasury Department, <clears throat> excuse me, sanctioned uh, four South African nationals uh, who were uh, believed to be receiving money from IS Central and disseminating it to um, members of the Islamic State in Mozambique. So this is coming to light uh, more and more frequently. Weapons transfers, we've seen evidence of in IS Sinai. And less frequently, we have heard claims, uh, though, though perhaps not um, confirmed, uh, of the Islamic State Central sort of having a greater hand in suggesting or orchestrating provinces' attacks. So, uh, one of the things that we argue, and we'll, we'll wrap up here in just a moment, is rather than the Islamic State Central's main influence on its African provinces being one of sort of commanding and controlling them, what we suggest is that African provinces, once they pledge allegiance and became official wilaya of the Islamic State, became what we call um, Islamic State norm adopters. Um, and by that, we mean they undertake Islamic State-like activity 
particularly Islamic State-like activity from 2014 to, say, 2017, when, when it was at the heyday of its um, sort of experience, without being explicitly directed by the Islamic State Central to do so. In other words, these African provinces, although they're not being necessarily directed by the Islamic State Central to do these sorts of things, their identities have changed. How they perceive themselves have changed once they become elevated to these provinces, and therefore they undertake new sorts of behavior that uh, they weren't doing before. What do we mean by this? So we see um, many of these Islamic State provinces undertaking beheadings, which had not been done prior to um, their pledges of allegiance. Uh, we see prison breaks occurring at a, at a far greater rate. Um, <coughs> Mimicking uh, some of the Islamic State Central's um, uh, modus operandi. Suicide bombings become far more common among these groups. Uh, many of these groups had very limited media presence before becoming Islamic State uh, provinces. Uh, many began to undertake governance in ways that they certainly had not prior to becoming Islamic State provinces. Um, and, and attempted city takeovers, right? Trying to sort of occupy and hold entire cities became a new sort of tactic once these groups were elevated to provincial status of the Islamic State. Um, let me see, I'm just trying to check on time. Um, we'll skip this, how, um, how these provinces interact with one another. Um, and, and we'll just move forward, we can talk about that later, but again, I wanna be sure we have time for discussion. So the, the, the sort of final question I'll ask is, you know, what is the outlook of the Islamic State uh, in the next three to five years? In my mind, and it, we can talk sort of in more detail about particular provinces, but in essence, uh, the Islamic State's province on the continent uh, looks to remain stable, uh, or I think um, in many places expand uh, somewhat significantly. So in essence, this is a, this is a really um, serious uh, topic that I think doesn't get enough attention. The Islamic State is really firmly implanted on the continent. Its presence um, in, in many, many different theaters is growing. Uh, it's becoming more deadly. And it's something that I think uh, we need to become much more aware of and take much more seriously um, than we have. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm sure there are far more questions that are yet to be answered than, than I've had time to address. But thank you for listening and, and let's open it up and hopefully Chris will, will jump in and um, speak uh, at length as well. Questions for Dr. Warner? Sure, Tony. Uh, yes, thanks for your time today. We appreciate it. Um, I am going to read the book because I am curious about how these different cells interact with each other. Um, one question I do have is it seems as though where um, all these IS affiliated cells thrive are also places where China's um, Belt Road Initiative is not necessarily um, taking hold. And we know that China has definitely done a sub-Saharan focus on expanding its influence into the continent. But do you see these as um, reasons that one's cause and effect, or are they both effects of the geopolitics and the resources? Uh, is is what the, in, in other, other words, words, are you suggesting? I'm sorry, yeah, please. In other words, I'm suggesting that um, I'm wondering if there's a relationship between the presence of IS affiliated groups and the lack of presence of Chinese uh, influence within the continent. Yeah, I, I would tend to think that that's more coincidental. In other words, and I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, I would, I would never suggest that um, these groups um, have decided to avoid emerging in places where there is a Chinese presence because, for instance, there might be some sort of tacit agreement. I don't know if that's what you were suggesting, but I think it, it would be s sort of more coincidental. Um, yeah, or the other way around, that perhaps okay. the situation's messy enough within those areas that ISIS thrives, uh -huh. that, uh, pardon me, that IS groups thrive, sure. that the Chinese do not want to uh, entangle themselves within the local politics. I didn't know no, if there was any evidence of that. No, certainly. I mean, I think it's just, um, I, I think that the latter example that you gave is probably the most accurate. And, and that's the case for, uh, you know, sort of any international investor where, where conflict um, is high, uh, investment sort of security is low. And so I think certainly that's that's the case. I mean, we can you know look to the Islamic State in Mozambique, 
where <clears throat> you know uh, millions and millions of dollars of of uh, oil investment were lost. <coughs> Excuse me. When um, the Islamic State of Mozambique really became quite violent, so I think it's just sort of a natural investment climate um, deterrent, which is you know one of a whole host of reasons why African governments are, are really eager to ensure that this is under control. It's not just a s sort of violence and instability, but really um, impacts on, <clears throat> excuse me, international investment climate. Thank you. I appreciate it. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, Ms. Hassan? So I have a question, please. Certainly. So, so ISIS, uh, so you know there is different uh, strands and uh, interpretation of Islam. So mm. you said uh, like ISIS used me the media to, to make groups or individual join them. So I wonder how they, if you are look or like have explanation, how they attract people to join them or how they attract groups to join them and also like uh, in like inspire them to use different tactics and strategies uh, based on different interpretation of Islam. How they mm. do that if especially there is no link between Africa, for example, Iraq or Libya, there is there's different totally different strands of Islamic interpretation here. So how's mm -hmm. that? Yeah, certainly, and and I think uh, um, Chris might be as as well situated to answer that question as I am. But one of the things that I think is important to recognize is that, um, despite the fact that the Islamic State is, uh, you know, a, a a jihadist organization with its own interpretation of Islam and 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 Salafism and and Takfirism, um, in many cases, religion I would argue is not even or has historically not even been a sort of main motivating factor for why some of these groups particularly individuals pledged allegiance so to your question of sort of like why are people joining i would argue that that the need for close religious alignment was in in the in almost all categories that we looked at was never really sort of coming to the fore as like why people um, and groups were pledging allegiance to the Islamic State Central. Um, it was more often for the accrual of material wealth, uh, for personal prestige, um, and and for economic um, sort of accrual. And so, um, you know, I, I would just suggest that at least in our cases, and, and again, you know, others may, may disagree, the question of religion was almost a subordinate uh, question. Um, of course, and you, you probably may know this better than anyone, uh, the Islamic State Central's propaganda machine was so influential in, in encouraging people to join, particularly between, you know, 2014 and 2017. So without going too far into it, um, th that's sort of how I would respond to that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Jason. I just sort of building on on, on that question. What, what, what were your findings on sort of how were there certain sort of communal groups like there's been talk about the Fulani, um, not just with ISIS, with Islamic State, but also with with, uh, you know, um, other sort of Al Qaeda affiliated groups, you know, the Fulani have these and other sort of ethnic groups have this pre these pre existing conflicts that have nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with jihadism, but then they see, oh, well, we can side with one or the other and then benefit from that or the would well, we go to 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 the uh, Central Africa province with the Allied Democratic Forces who have at various times seem to have shopped around for different, you know, uh, things to sort of move toward and move away from. So where do these sort of pre-existing social ties, let's call them, you know, in you know, what what role did, did you find that those played in, in determining whether certain groups moved toward or away from from, from ISIS or Islamic State? Certainly, you know, it, it's a fantastic point. I mean, uh, they're, they're incredibly influential. I think, Chris, you've just underscored the point that I was trying to make, but I think you, you made it probably more artfully than I did. Um, again, re religion sort of, it, in many cases, was never the motivating factor. It was sort of these very instrumental reasons um, for joining. And so to your point, you know, this, this phenomenon of, um, you know, intercommunal grievances, was a really significant motivating factor in in the case of joining in 
of the Islamic State in uh, Mozambique, in Sinai. Uh, I would also argue in Libya, in, in the Greater Sahara, certainly. Um, you know, anti-statist attitudes certainly um, were the prevailing or one of the prevailing uh, sort of antipathies uh, or, or motivating factors in, in many of these cases as well. So, you know, in many cases, again, I would just sort of underscore, it wasn't necessarily about religion and sort of significant buy-in to what the Islamic State Central was selling ideologically or theologically, but rather um, the, the mere affiliation with this <coughs> globally powerful pole of power was viewed to be a sort of ideal way, an ideal sort of pathway for groups that wanted something that they didn't have, whether it was dominance over their um, you know, ethnic rivals, whether it was greater representation in the state, whether it was greater economic accumulation. For whatever reason, for many of these groups, that, that Pledge of Allegiance was really viewed to be beneficial and a sort of superior, a superior mode to that, you know, the achievement of some of those goals. But absolutely, Chris, you're, you're certainly correct. Then, then if there's no final, are there any final questions for Dr. Warner from anyone in the audience? If not, I have a, a final set of questions for you. Okay, so what what historically sort of briefly and, and we'll end on this and, and thank you for joining us, even though you're you're still recovering from uh, and don't feel well. So thank you very much for that. What historically have has US sort of other counterterrorism and also uh, whether through USAID sort of other other kinds of programs been toward dealing with the security threats? How do, has the US government? How do we view? the threats also not only to our allies on the continent, but also sort of more broadly, whether it's directly to the U.S. homeland or also now with the sort of the turn and increasing focus on strategic competition and with China's investment and expansion, et cetera, um, outside of the of, of, of the Indo-PACOM AOR. So what, what historically has been the U.S. Uh, approach toward that and how has it changed sort of maybe over the last you know, several presidential administrations. Has there been a shift, and and is the the current the the President Biden's administration have there been any major changes in approach from let's say the previous two uh, presidential administrations? Sure, certainly. Yeah, I, I think um, <laughs> overall, um, and I've I've written uh, about this somewhat recently. Um, you know, in essence, I think twenty years after nine eleven, it's fair to say. Uh, U.S. counterterrorism efforts on the continent have arguably, uh, or, or inarguably, ha have not really succeeded and, and have arguably exacerbated problems. I mean, I think that's sort of like the, the broad takeaway is that whatever the United States has been doing, um, it, it, it's been insufficient and there's improvements that need to be made. I think historically, <clears throat> particularly um, since roughly 2008, uh, the United States focus on counterterrorism in Africa has really sort of, I don't want to say exclusively, come at the exclusion of um, more robust political engagements, more robust, more robust um, development engagements, more, uh, you know, more robust economic engagements. But certainly, um, and, and particularly during the past administration, the sort of thrust of how the U.S. sought to engage, particularly in the security sphere, but even more broadly on the continent, was through a pretty narrow lens of um, counterterrorism efforts. I think increasingly this is is coming to light, and I think there's a general consensus, maybe not a complete consensus, but a general consensus among people in the U.S. government that this sort of um, strictly military or predominantly military approach really has got to change. Uh, it's it's proven to be rather ineffective, even if to some extent, um, some degree of this is, is continuously needed. Um, <clears throat> in terms of near peer competition, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're all too aware um, that, you know, Russia's, excuse me, China's presence has been, has, has, has been visible on the continent for, you know, more than a decade. But I would argue um, that it's really Russia's presence, um, not only because of the, the, the the war in Ukraine, but even prior to that, we've been, of course, seeing the emergence um, and, and sort of collusion of Russian uh, PMCs in places like Libya, like Qatar, uh, increasingly like Mali, uh, where there's really a desire to sort of undermine 
um, historical sort of norms of cooperation that, that the United States and its allies have enjoyed with African states, particularly in the security sphere. So, you know, in my mind, like that's where the next, excuse me, <coughs> that's where the next uh, sort of locus of activity is in terms of strategic competition. I think it's more uh, looking at Russia's <coughs> presence in the security sphere um, than it is China's in the economic sphere. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. And yes, thank you uh, to the audience for attending. And yeah, everyone have a have a great day. Thank you. Thank great. you very much. Yeah. Thanks.